Good evening. This is Pastor Jeff Person coming to you again on Wednesday, September the 2nd um, for another edition of Wednesday Reflections. Uh, we began doing this, I believe it was uh, mid-March, and we're still rolling along. I missed last Wednesday, and I apologize for that, but I was a little under the weather, and uh, we'll be sharing more about that maybe in next week's video. But this week, uh, seizing the moment, if you will, I want to share some things um, that, you know, that are kind of on the surface of my heart right now. You know, there's times and experiences that we go through that tend to dig deep into our hearts and our minds and they pull pulls things up to the surface. Well, this week has been has been one of those kinds of times. As you see, there's a house behind me. Well, I happen to be located at 124 Hazel Street. I think I've got the house number right. Uh, here in Plymouth. And this was the home of Arthur and Irene Wilson, my, my aunt and uncle. Uh, this was a special place to not only me, but my entire family, uh, especially those that are numbered among the greater Jethro clan, if you will. Uh, this became the second home place, if you will, for our gatherings. The first home place was just uh, not even a half a mile hardly down the road down Garrett's Island Road on the right. It was a little white clapboard shack that was the, that was the home of Jack and Essie Jethro. Uh, they lived many other places prior to that time, but that's the only place that I knew that they lived. Uh, we moved here to Plymouth in 1966 when I was six years old. Uh, my father got a job with Warehouser and moved back home to the area of where my wife was, where my mother rather was raised. And we lived in a little, what we called the pink house, right beside grandmother and granddaddy on Garrett's Island Road there. Uh, we lived there for about five years until we built, my dad and mom built a house down what we used to call the Dismal Road. Um, I believe that was in 71, I think. But said all that to say, to say this, the little white clapboard shack down Garrett Silent Road was, um, <laughs> I still view it as somewhat hallowed ground. Uh, as my grandmother and grandfather aged, uh, they eventually moved in with my aunt and uncle, Arthur and Irene Wilson, in this home that you see behind me. And that became the, the new meeting place, if you will. I remember such great gatherings, family gatherings at both home places, uh, stirs up so many great memories. It, it's amazing how that a sound or a smell can dig back in your past and just stir up an old, old memory. Every time I hear a screen door squeak as it closes, uh, I get a flashback to the old house there on Garrett's Island Road every time the door would close. And and uh, we kids would be in and out more often than we should have. And my grandfather, Jack, was sitting in the rocking chair on one side of the wood stove and my grandmother, Essie, on the other side of the wood stove. And you knew you were getting on granddaddy's nerves when he would, and I'm gonna demonstrate now, when he would take his hand and rub his forehead like that. You knew that it was time to clear out. We had been coming in and out too much and he had heard that screen door slam one too many times. Um, I remember as a child playing in the yard, uh, not realizing at the time how special and precious those moments were. But as a child playing in the yard and I would hear a sound. It's so many sounds children hear today, sounds of video games and televisions and stereos and phones and so many sounds that are competing for their attention but the sound that caught my attention as a child playing in the dirt in my grandmother and granddaddy's driveway was the sound of my grandmother praying i remember the first time i heard it i wondered what my grandmother was upset about and i went up and peeped in through the screen door and that rocking chair was just a going back and forth because the spirit of the lord was moving upon her and, and she was praying 
and pouring her heart out to her father. I'll never forget those moments. And there's so many other moments that I can share or could share, but time will not afford in this short video that I want to do today. But behind me, this home here became the second meeting place after they moved out of the old shack on Garrett's Island. The family would gather here. And the grounds that you see here behind me, this beautiful lawn that my Uncle Arthur was so proud of, it would be filled with cars and children and, and all kinds of, of uh, generational connections going on, eating around the table. Oh, I will share this quick story. Back at the old home place on Garrett's Island, uh, it was not a sexist thing. <laughs> it wouldn't fly too well in today's culture, unfortunately. But because of space, we were very limited space. We would gather for meals, and I was probably in my early 20s before I really understood the concept of a family reunion because we just had them about every week. It, it may have been planned, but I wasn't aware of any plans. People just kind of showed up at grandmother's house uh, kind of all at the same time, and there was always food at grandmother's house. And there was a little dining room attached to the kitchen there, and it was kind of, they had taken a wall down. It was kind of a great room kind of thing. Very small area, a sink with one cold water tap. That's the only plumbing they had in the house. They had the outhouse out back and uh, used the chamber pops uh, during the night, otherwise known as what we called them slop jars. And uh, they had a rain barrel out back that you would rinse them out with after you uh, took care of things. And I know that's way more information than you needed to know. But at one of these family get-togethers that were just a regular naturally occurring thing, uh, the men would all sit down first at the table. The women would have been cooking and serving and the men would eat and and it was not, as I said, not a sexist thing. It was just the fact that men ate quick and they would get out of the way and then the women could sit and eat and visit all as long as they wanted. The children, however, never got to the table. Uh, we had TV trays and trays we would sit in our lap, but none of us complained about any of this. But I remember one, one day I was probably, I don't know, I'm guessing uh, 10, 11 years old. And one of my uncles happened to not be there that particular time. I don't remember which one it was. But anyway, there was a vacant chair at the table. And one of my other uncles saw me walk by and said, Hey, Jeff, come on and sit down. Oh, man, you talk about poking your chest out, broadening your shoulders. That was kind of a rite of passage. It was that moment that I began to feel like a man, though I was just a kid. Uh, they probably never knew at the time how meaningful that would be as I would look back on it now. I'm 60 years old and how I would look back upon those precious moments. But we would have similar moments here as after I would be grown and we would move away and we would come back to visit and the gatherings would take place here at my Aunt Irene and Uncle Arthur's house. Uh, I know I'm sounding fairly nostalgic today, but it got me to thinking about heritage and how wonderful a heritage I've been blessed with. Now, I understand that we're not supposed to just look backwards, and, but we're supposed to look forward. But there's a passage of Scripture that began to kind of grip my heart this week as I was dealing with all these emotions as we're getting the house ready uh, to sell. By the way, it's a wonderful, godly Christian couple that are buying the house, and we're so grateful for that and so honored for that, for them to carry on the spiritual legacy that my aunt and uncle lived in this house. But this passage of Scripture that Ben just kind of kept circling in my mind was in Hebrews chapter 12, where the scripture says that, now Hebrews 11 is the hall of the faithful, we would call it. Those that 
was remarkable their faith was remarkable enough to be included in this listing of people that it, God with the Holy Ghost would say it was imputed unto them for righteousness their faith person after person was listed men and women and they, some named and some unnamed. But they would list all of these people. But then Hebrews 12 would begin. Now, now, wherefore, in other words, because of everything you've just heard, wherefore, seeing you're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, the scripture would go on to say, lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset you. Run the race with patience. And then it would say in the very next verse, the words, look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And then it said something very conspicuous, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That is a, that is a, a phrase or a clause of that verse that has always captured my mind and my heart, who for the joy set before him. In other words, what the writer was saying here is that there was something in the future that captured Christ's attention to the, to the, to, to the degree, a sense of purpose, a sense of, of destiny, a sense of joy, the joy set before him. And I submit to you that that joy that was set before him is all of us that are redeemed, that are counted among the redeemed who for the joy set before him, he was able to endure the cross. And so in that context, I understand that we, we can't dwell in the past, but we must look forward and have our hearts fixed upon something in our future. And for us as the body of Christ, that future is eternity with Christ in heaven. That is the joy set before us. So because of that joy set before us, we can endure anything for this time. So having said that just now, why did I talk about my heritage? Why, why did I talk about all those things? It's because in the previous verse he says, Wherefore, seeing we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, I know you hear all kind of colloquialism said in funerals, and you hear people talk about where well, their loved one is watching down over them, and their, their, their loved one is seeing what they do. I don't know how far you take that. But I do know the scripture said, seeing we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, not just those patriarchs, not just those listed in Hebrews 11, but I submit to you in my own context, wherefore seeing I'm surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, my heritage, my grandmother, my granny on my father's side, Hattie, my grandmother and grandfather, Jack and Essie Jethro, people like Arthur and Irene Wilson, who lived in this home behind me. Those are elements that make up my heritage. And because that is my heritage, that my, my heritage literally holds me accountable. I had the great privilege this week, this past Sunday of, of uh, looking up after one of the early prayers in the service and looking up and seeing my uncle Philip Jethro and his wife Darlene come in to visit us that Sunday. And it was a joy to have him there, him being retired pastor now who was such an instrumental part in mentoring me as a pastor now uh, from afar. He didn't really knew what kind of impact he was having on me, but listening to his messages and letting him feed my spirit as I was a young pastor starting out, uh, was just so meaningful to me. And then to have him there listening to me preach. And I, I went to him after service and he, he spoke to me in kind of a softer voice because he is not loud like he used to be. But uh, he said, you did good today. And then he said something that was most meaningful to me. He said, Essie, smiling.
You see, that heritage is one of the elements that holds me accountable. One of the great problems we have today in our culture is that so few people are willing to embrace accountability. It's like, I'm going to do my thing and cast their heritage away. And I know that not all of us have the wonderful heritage that I was privileged to be raised in, the wonderful Christian loving environment. But that's the context that I live under. And that's the context of my past. And that past becomes an accountable force in my life because as I stand before God, most of all I want to please Him. As I stand before the people and preach the gospel, having pleased Him, I also want to honor my heritage. I also want to honor those that went before me because their very presence in my mind and in my life holds me accountable. I encourage you today, embrace accountability. It's not a bad thing. It will guard your heart. It will keep you from doing wrong. Because having that, having that layer of accountability in your life, thinking about how you affect your name, thinking about how you affect your reputation, thinking about what kind of either pride or reproach that you would bring, honor or reproach that you would bring upon your fam family name. It would do well for us in this generation, in this time, in this period, for us to be considerate of those things, for, for us to give honor to those things. A another thing that my heritage does that helps me to look forward is it's the lens that I look through as I see the future, as I see what's ahead. You see, I have a biblical worldview that was placed in me, ingrained in my heart by my wonderful family. And that's the lens that I look through. And what I find myself doing, I was thinking about this just, just a while ago. Every morning, one of the things I do when I wake up is I get my glasses out of the case. And before I put them on my face, I get a cloth that I have there in my drawer, nightstand drawer and I clean my lens. I wipe them off so that when I put them on, I'm seeing things clearly. And I'm not hindered by dirt and specks and things that would hinder my vision. Might that be what the writer of Hebrews meant in Hebrews 12 when he said, Wherefore, seeing you're compassed about so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Might we all benefit from taking a moment each day, contemplating our heritage, contemplating what Christ has done for us, wipe our lens so that we're seeing clearly because beloved <laughs> there is a joy set before us and i believe with all my heart we're nearing the finish line my grandmother used to sing around the house an old song the last mile of the way beloved i believe we're in the last mile and I, that is the most important regardless of what stumbling you've done up to this point stand Think about the heritage that you have. Think about what Christ has done for you. And then allow the Holy Spirit to wipe your lens each and every day to, so that you never lose sight of what you're fighting for. You never lose sight of what you're living for. Beloved, we're not living for a house. We're not living for boats and, or whatever other form of recreation. We're not living for those things. We're living for an eternity. And I've got to allow my heritage to have an influence on how I see the future, to hold me accountable to what Christ has put into me. 
Could I just encourage you right now to take your spiritual glasses off and wipe them off? Father, as we right now take our hearts, our minds, our perceptions, and we put them in your hands and ask you, Lord, to wipe them, to remove everything that is not like you, to remove everything, Father, that would hinder, that would cause me to be distracted. Lord, I don't know about others, but when my glasses get dirty and I don't deal with it, I eventually will get a headache looking through all the trash. And Father, I understand that there are things that can get attached to our lives that, that are not wholesome and they cause us to have spiritual headaches. They cause this life to be grievous. But Father, there's nothing like being able to see you. The further I get on this journey, Lord, the more and more I realize what I need each and every day is a fresh revelation of you, to see you clearly. It's when I get my attention off of you that I tend to stray, that I tend to veer, or that I tend to become anxious. But Lord, help me today and help others that are under the sound of my voice right now as I'm praying for them as well. Help them, Father, to see you clearly. And let the wonderful heritage that we have become a, an accountable force, a guide, the lens through which we see you. And Father, I give you praise and I thank you, Father, for the lives of those that you placed in my life to make me who I am today. I am forever grateful for that. And I pray your blessings on each of them. And I pray your blessing on the people today. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Again, I love you. It's so good to, and I'm honored to be able to weekly meet with you and to share my heart with you. Take some time to reflect on what I've talked about today. We're surrounded by such a beautiful cloud of witnesses. Don't be afraid of it. Embrace it. God bless you is my prayer.